Onk Live Insights is a video editorial program produced by Onk Live. The mechanism of action of the CDK inhibitors is really interesting. I remember when the you know first PARP inhibitor turned out to not be a PARP inhibitor, inhibitor. But uh, when that first came out, we had to have a primer uh, at a large national, international meeting about what actually PARP was. We didn't know. And similar with CDK, a little bit better, but similar that you know there are a lot of cyclin-dependent kinases, uh, and they work in different mechanisms and in different pathways. And what we're focusing on here is CDK4-6, so cyclin-dependent kinase 4-6, that associate with cyclin D1 in the cell cycle pathway. And it's actually very interesting. So ret the retinoblastoma gene is something that's near and dear to my heart because it's a tumor suppressor gene and really helped us to understand a lot about tumor suppressor genes and what drives you know, sort of oncogenes, what drives cancer growth in the very early days of molecular biology. Uh, and it's important in many cancers, but not in breast cancer. But what turns out that retinoblastoma plays a special role in controlling the cell cycle. So when retinoblastoma is phosphorylated, it's turned off. So it can't check uh, cyclin D1 and uh, CDK4-6. So the, the retinoblastoma is really important in being able to turn on and off CDK4-6 enzymes and their ability to turn on cyclin D1 and cell cycling through the uh, cell cycle pathway. So, if you block phosphorylation of retinoblastoma, it actually turns it on, right? So then retinoblastoma can block that pathway. Phosphorylated, it's off. So the cyclin-dependent uh, kinase inhibitors basically block the phosphorylation of retinoblastoma, allowing it to act as a tumor suppressor. So it's a very cool mechanism. Now, how that actually plays out in the actual mechanism of how this is helping hormone therapy to work so well in breast cancer, uh, we don't know. Uh, but that is the mechanism in the laboratory, and the, the data really, um, very, very good data from Rich Finn and Dennis Slayman from UCLA looking at their cell lines and showing that these agents are very potent in hormone receptor positive, more proliferative tumor cell lines. Uh, and so that's where all of this came about. We have the really exciting data from palbociclib, and we also have two other CDK4-6 inhibitors that are in clinical trials. So LEE-011 uh, is a uh, cyclin-dependent kinase 4-6 inhibitor that's very similar to palbociclib in terms of its toxicity profile, where neutropenia is by far the most common toxicity occurring, occurring in almost all patients, uh, but with little uh, associated febrile neutropenia. Uh, though that drug is in a number of different trials uh, called the Mona Lisa trials, and they're studying, again, very similar to the way uh, palbociclib was studied in the Paloma trials, where you're combining it in the first line setting with a non steroidal aromatase inhibitor in the second and greater line setting with fulvestrant. And then one other area of study, because uh, Novartis that has LEE-011 also has a number of different very potent PI3 kinase inhibitors, is based on laboratory data suggesting that combinations of inhibitors in the PI3 kinase pathway and CDK4-6 might synergize because they block these two different pathways that are felt to be very important in generating resistance to hormone therapy. Uh, so that's being studied as well, uh, both in combination with the mTOR inhibitor Everolimus and with the alpha-specific PI3 kinase inhibitor BYL719 or alpelacib. Uh, and then the third CDK inhib inhibitor is the most different, a uh, bemaciclib, uh, Lily's CDK4-6 inhibitor, instead of being given for three weeks on, one week off, the way the other two are given, allowing the time for the bone marrow to recover, uh, uh, bemaciclib can be given continuously, and that's because it causes less bone marrow suppression. We don't know why. It's very interesting. It causes more diarrhea, which you see as a very uh, low incident side effect with the other two CDK4-6 inhibitors. Diarrhea is enough with a bemaciclib that patients have to have anti-diarrheal medication up front at home so that they, you know, because 
uh, many patients will get at least some degree of diarrhea. It seems to be reasonably con easily controllable with antidiarrheal medications and not continue. So it goes up and down, but it's fairly mild and modest uh, in certainly uh, all of the patients I've seen on the drug. Uh, when we have a larger experience, of course, we'll have a better idea. Interestingly, abemaciclib has been studied in a now uh, completed uh, single agent phase two trial because Abamaciclib, again, unlike the other two, seems to have some single agent activity. So it'll be fascinating to see in a heavily pretreated hormone resistant group what does abemaciclib do. That trial should report in the next year. And then there's also, of course, uh, the, and that's a Monarch trial as well. This is the Monarch series. We have different names for each series. Uh, the other thing that's very interesting about the Monarch trials, which are similar to everything we heard about in terms of Paloma and Mona Lisa, you know, first line with a non steroidal with full vestrant and the second or greater line. But they also have another trial, which is looking at abemaciclib in brain metastases and ER positive disease, because there is very good evidence that the drug crosses, crosses the blood brain barrier. So I'm excited to see the results of that trial as well. At least we're looking at different directions and in areas that are really important to women who have advanced breast cancer. Of course, all of these agents are being moved into the early stage setting as well. You know, we're interested now in trying to understand what are the markers of resistance to these drugs as well. And it turns out that, you know, a, a small number of tumors have phosphorylated RB. And those tumors uh, that upregulate RB, it's all phosphorylated, may be resistant to CDK inhibition. Uh, and maybe we'll be able to overcome it by adding another agent or potentially altering the, ag altering the agent we add in the future. Uh, so we'll see. CDK-4-6 inhibitors, despite having been approved by the FDA now for the treatment of first-line metastatic breast cancer estrogen positive, we would like to see if there's actually going to be a survival advantage to the addition of these agents to endocrine therapy in first line. When we treat patients with metastatic cancer, there are three things that we need to prioritize. Prolongation of survival. We want to make sure that we're palliating symptoms. And we want to make sure we're giving people qual a good quality of life. So despite the promising activity that these agents bring when added to endocrine therapy, like everything else we do in terms of treatment, you have to individualize therapy. These are not going to be for everybody. For instance, if you have a patient that has been newly diagnosed with metastatic cancer, has never had endocrine therapy before, chances are that patient may do well just with endocrine therapy and may not need the addition of a CDK4-6 inhibitor in order to have a better outcome or a better survival. So I'm a little hesitant of using this on absolutely everybody because some of these patients are going to do just well with simpler therapies that will give them a better quality of life. So I'd like to see results of overall survival advantage first before I commit to saying that this is going to revolutionize the treatment of ER positive breast cancer for all women. Now, if you have a patient that has had a fairly short interval between finishing their adjuvant therapy and having a metastatic recurrence, or somebody that has recurred even within their adjuvant endocrine therapy, clearly these drugs may play a big role in circumventing resistance to endocrine therapies and potentially could make a difference in survival and a much better outcome for these patients.